I think the first mid or the first area which we make is we all think, you know, we need to first have the money to actually manage our money. In fact, it's the other way around. You know, we need to start managing our money so that we can have that money. Do we think that money is evil? I think uh, my humble realization is money is in fact just a multiple. This is the Native Stroke Show, episode 4 with Francis Haukip. Uh, he is the current CEO of uh, Pragnea Advisory Limited and an IIM and IIT alumni, a husband and a father. So welcome to the show, Mr. Haukip. Thank you so much, Richard. It's an honor and absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, we've been uh, wanting to have you on the show for quite a long time and then we've been planning. Finally, we are here. So uh, I'll give you a scenario to start off. Uh, okay. You know, so you and I are going to team up and we're going to sure. make a startup based on the current market in the hometown. So we'll okay. have uh, two lakhs at a, as a seed capital and okay. another two lakh as company assets. We'll have to be okay. prof profitable within this next six months and okay. uh, grow at a considerably good rate. So okay. how would we go about that? Uh, how would what sector should we choose? What kind of product should we be launching? How would we go about? And then how do we do we disseminate our two two lakh seed capital? Okay. Very very interesting questions. In fact, if you had actually a much bigger amount, you know, we'd have actually <laughs> a lots of other opportunities. But since two lakh is actually quite quite limited, so there the, could be. Yeah, yeah, so the reason sure, to lack like is, yeah, it's something that, uh, you know, it's something that is very achievable for a normal person. True. Yeah, go Absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. So, you know, when uh, lots of startup and, you know, lots of business uh, depends on the amount of capital, because the amount of mm. business or opportunities which you can capitalize on depends on the initial seed capital or the amount you can put forth. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly said, two lakhs is something which you know, is affordable or can be managed by lots of people back home. So with two lakhs, actually, as you also rightly said, it's limited. But I think few opportunities back home for people with two lakhs is you could open up uh, a small uh, store like you have the normal two mm -hmm. cans, right? Where yeah, yeah. You have you take uh, people from the wholesale market and you actually sell it on the, at the retail prices mm -hmm. and you get a marked up of maybe, you know, two rupees, three rupees or five rupees per item. Mm -hmm. I think for back home, I think lots of people are already doing that. And I think that is uh, a good place to start with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, at the rate of, uh, you know, having a seed capital of two lakhs, because uh, you just need to get a small space, which I think, you know, with back home, lots of that can be managed without a huge capital expenditure, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And land is usually the highest capital or the highest uh, initial startup cost, which most of us already have right mm -hmm. in you know in a in closer house or you know somewhere we can actually rent it from somebody you know in a yeah. good location so that initial setup cost in terms of the land and having that small store built up that can be managed at very minimal cost back home so i think that's a huge advantage and with the two lakhs actually most of it can be spent into you know getting the initial you know uh, supplies that you want to actually yeah keep in the store so i think with two likes that's something which is you know small pandugan that we have back home that's i think it's a very good uh, you know business which can be started mm -hmm. the second uh, which i see lots of people doing right now is you know this second hand supply yeah yeah right so they open those bill and you know, lots of people are actually doing that i think in the lockdown so that also is very uh, low capital intensive, I would say, mm -hmm. because you just have to take, uh, you know, buy one bear, open it and then sell. So you can keep the capital running. So you don't need a very huge uh, startup capital in that mm -hmm. sense. Right. Yeah. That could be the other business we could look at. Mm -hmm. The other, I would say, coming from the finance background, OK, it might be mm -hmm. slow. We could be profitable immediately and it could be a little slow is uh, in sort of a small finance uh, or lending, uh, you know, the NBFC mm -hmm. sort of thing in the company. Mm -hmm. It can't be a big NBFC because, uh, as, as, as you know, yeah. NBFCs at least require, you know, two crores and a big money exactly. to start with. But at least at the, you know, at the starting level, we could start a small lending business, you know, whereby uh, unlike uh, our typical money lending business where, you know, people actually keep paying you the interest mm. and at the end of, you know, maybe two or three years after you want to repay, you actually repay the principal. Yeah. So that makes it hard for lots of other borrowers. Mm. So if we are starting our business, I would suggest, you know, we replicate the bank model mm. whereby we say, okay, fine, we'll uh, allow you to pay it back in the form of EMIs, mm -hmm. right? Whereby you 
repay the part of the principal as well. Mm. So that's easier for you. So maybe in three years or in two years, you would have repaid, you know, your principal as well. So and for us also because the EMI would keep coming in, mm. so we can recycle that. You know, we can yeah. relend that again and you know, keep the business going. Mm. So that's sort of probably the three business we could start off that comes uh, directly to mind right now. But if I have any other business, we can of course sit yeah. down and chat for that. <laughs> and I think uh, out of the three, I think the first and the third one is are more scalable in terms yes, of you know yes. going. Yes, that's true. That's yeah. true. That's and true. the second yeah. one, I doubt it would be scalable because we'll still be like uh, those uh, you know. Uh, uh, a small shop or you know so yes, yes. Uh, we will at the end of the day still be a second hand shop right whereas yes, uh, yes. the first one can be a variety shop going to you know a bigger yeah, setup yeah, and then yeah. uh, and then the third one can be you know a, a, a microfinancing option slowly right, going up right. and then you can in fact assist a lot of right. the business in their startup so right, right. yeah i think that's a good option but yeah, uh, maybe of course one option given our skill set. You know, I'm from hmm. finance background. You are from a design background, so we could also open maybe some design company. You know, where mm -hmm. you know it's a low capital intensive as well. We just need a laptop, you know, and the technical yeah. skill, yeah. counting or backing with your backing of your skill set. Probably <laughs> that's other business we could consider. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, right. So. You know, uh, finance is one of the biggest, uh, you know, whether it's PR within our Amy tribe or within the right. bigger context or as a, uh, uh, everywhere, it's been a problem, right? Managing right. wealth, managing your own finances. So are you saying that everybody can be wealthy or uh, including person S like me? <laughs> of course, of course. See, the good thing about, uh, let's say, our economy, the Indian economy mm. or, you know, economy, India, any uh, sort of a democratic or any capitalist economy. Mm. Okay, we, of course, we are not fully a capitalist, uh, you know, economy like maybe the US. Mm. But still, even India is not too bad in that sense. And the best uh, thing about, you know, that kind of economy or the capitalist economy is irrespective of your background, right, irrespective mm. of your, you know, upbringing. You know, anybody can become a millionaire or a billionaire, right? Because yeah. as long as you, everybody has the right to equal opportunities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's the education system or even opportunities or even the business. So the good thing about, let's say, even India is as long as you, know, you have what it takes and you are willing to make the sacrifices and put in the hard work, you can you can become rich you can become a millionaire you can become successful so mm -hmm. you know this uh, is not limited uh, whereby you know only a certain select of people can only you know reach the top or become rich mm -hmm. so i think that is a good time or a good uh, country or a good economy that we are in whereby you know it's up to you provided you are willing to put in the hard work and you know willing to make the sacrifices anybody can become rich mm -hmm. so i think definitely anybody can become rich including both of us yeah and what do you see uh, like uh, i mean uh, uh, we'll concentrate mostly on our a uh, lot of the uh, our community so what sure. do you see one thing that uh, everybody make mistakes when managing their finances actually there uh, one i'll just uh, highlight two three myths or mistakes mm. which we make and which i also personally make and which is the history of the background of the youtube channel and the personal finance you know mm. interest in personal finance and other finance management is uh, you know even uh, when i upload all these videos uh, lots of the comments which i get and the first myth i think which we need to destroy is people say i'll watch your video after i have some money to manage right yeah. i don't have the money mm. i'll my, i'll think about personal finance when i have the money <laughs> In fact, it's the other way around, right? Exactly. You need to manage your money to have the money. money yeah. So, which is also a realization which I personally also had. Because as you know, I actually worked with NTPC after my engineering. Mm. And, you know, I actually shared in a few of my you know, discussions and videos. Mm. I say, okay, maybe if I get another 30,000 per month now, you know, mm. I could be personally or personally or financially quite self-sufficient. Mm. Then, you know, when I went to SEBI, in fact, you know, my slave went up by, you know, more than that. Then I started thinking, maybe if I now have 40, 50,000 more per month, maybe I'll be self-sufficient, right? Yeah, yeah. So then I moved to Pragnia and it did increase. Then again, maybe if I now get one more, one lakh more per month, maybe I'll be self-sufficient, right? Yeah. So there's no end to it. And mm -hmm. my re simple realization was, you know, it's not about the money which is coming in. It's about how you manage the money which has come in. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that's when I actually personally took lots of interest, you know, in personal finance and how you actually manage your, you know, finances. In fact, in one of the videos, I've highlighted the mm-hmm. 50-30-20 rule or the five buckets in which we should allocate our income and all that. So I think the first made or the first error which we make is we all think, you know, we need to first have the money to actually manage our money. In fact, it's the other way around. You know, we need to start managing our money so that we can have that money. So yeah. I think that's probably the first mistake and the first myth. And uh, the second myth, because we also all come from a Christian background and all that. And most of the times, I think one of the feeling, uh, sometimes poverty is kind of overrated, you know, mm-hmm. in the sense we think that money is evil, right? I think uh, my humble realization is money is, in fact, just a multiplier, mm-hmm. right? The fact that money is an evil is just the myth. Money is just a multiplier. It just multiplies how good or how bad you are. Mm-hmm. Right. If you're a good person, if you have more money, you'll do more good works and you'll, in fact, become a better person. Let's yeah. look at some of the billionaires who are doing lots of charity work and, you know, helping people from all walks of life. And if you're a bad person, you have more money, you'll become, you know, that much more you know, bad or, you know, you'll do much more bad things uh, for in the world. So I think the second myth is money per se is not evil or it's not bad. It's the person who actually manages that money which matters. And mm-hmm. money is, in mm-hmm. fact, you know, just a simple multiplier. Mm-hmm. I think those are the two, you know, biggest uh, uh, myths or, uh, you know, mistake which we make. Mm. And once we take that out of the equation, then, you know, I think lots of things will fall in place. And the third, of course, is as you also mentioned in the first question, anybody can become rich provided you know how to manage, right? Mm. So once you start managing, uh, the fact with money management with lots of people, you know, keep talking about is, you have to look in terms of how to, you know, multiply your money. How can I double? How can I, you know, double my money? And it's quite additive. So if you don't have money, you know, you'll always, and most of the billionaires say, you know, or the first crore is the most difficult to make. Mm. Once you make the first crore, then the other, you know, it becomes very easy because more of, it's quite additive in that sense. So once you start saving and you used to have, you know, maybe 10,000 in your, uh, in our account, having another 10,000 or making it one lakh become that much easier. Yeah. So, you know, money adds money kind of. Uh, that's the kind of another thing about uh, you know money and this finance so if we provided we pay close attention and we make the effort as we just discussed you know once you start managing it you know you'll also find other ways of to get more income or more revenue as well so Mm -hmm. it kind of have a cascading effect you know even on the income side and even the way you manage so you know you find more ways to invest and multiply and all that so I think the first thing is you know we have saved that habit of saving and then investing and you know once you develop that skill and you know the other perception about money is everybody thinks finance is very complicated in mm-hmm. fact personal finance you know lots of people all the commentary you would see they would say it's all maybe 10 percent or 20 percent is about the knowledge or the theory 80 percent is about the habit right so yeah. it's about yeah. taking the action so conceptually it's quite simple anybody can do it. it's not you don't need a finance guru or you don't need a finance degree mm-hmm. to actually manage your personal finances so if you have make that effort and that conscious effort right to develop certain small habits i think that's all you know we need to actually become rich or manage our finances uh, much better yeah yeah that that's true and also you know it, uh, finances is like a i would say uh, like a water and uh, when right. you when you're taking bath uh, maybe you can manage it a single bucket full of water right, right. or maybe yeah. you need a two bucket of water some people right. might just be uh, might not be able to f- uh, yeah it might need more than five buckets so it's right. how it's about how you manage it you know you'd be able to exactly. clean yourself with a single bucket as well but if you mm-hmm. want you have the luxury to use two bucket as well so it's right. up to you right. how you manage that buckets of water exactly. <laughs> that's, exactly. that's what exactly. I feel exactly. yeah and actually in one of the videos I actually talked about doing that monthly cash flow review mm-hmm. right wherein you know you if you're single you sit alone and if it's a family definitely with your spouse you sit down and review you know your uh, just develop the habit of doing a monthly review of your expenses or your cash flows that itself can have you know so much effect on the way you manage your money because yeah even after we got married, you know, a few months we enjoyed. Then later on, when we started doing that, you now you realize so many, you know, much of money or expenses goes where you don't realize that actually so much have gone. And then, you know, naturally, you don't have to tell each other. Mm. Naturally, after seeing that, uh, you know, list, you started cutting, you know, it off, you know, cutting off or, you know, reducing those unnecessary expenses on your own because it becomes, you know, self-correcting. And, and one thing I realize is that, uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do that. 
to really look at yes. your finances and yeah, then yeah. Uh, you know, do the balance sheet personally yes, yes. because yeah. we want to hide away from that and you know just go with the flow but yes. uh, you, you need to br- be brave enough to do that that's what i feel yeah yeah, yeah you need that discipline definitely yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and uh, you know <clears throat> i mean f- uh, when it comes to finances and it's a basically a personal decision and their rick's appetite on how to invest or how to save up but uh, right. what would be you suggest like a good option up uh, uh, like for example uh, what a layman can just uh, do you know just can take up like one or two options that are very easy to do right so in terms of uh, investments actually i actually discussed a few options in uh, one of my videos as well mm-hmm. as you know even on the organized sector mm-hmm. right you have uh, various options uh, actually i talked about the savings uh, account deposit right mm-hmm. and you also have the fixed deposit mm-hmm. and then you have the mutual funds and then you know the stock markets and yeah. these other options so the thing about the savings uh, account deposit is you're actually losing money because uh, the average inflation in our country is at least 6 7% yeah. and you're getting a 2 3% interest on your savings account deposit so in fact you're actually losing money by putting money in the savings deposit mm. so if you put in the fixed deposit you're getting a 6 7% which at least helps you beat you know the inflation mm-hmm. so that's uh, the second option we could consider so if you want to actually beat inflation and actually generate a positive return one of the emphasis which i have been actually making to everybody is at least invest in mutual funds yeah. because okay the stock market because you're directly investing gets risky and you need mm. some knowledge and some discipline to actually you know get into that kind of investments but mutual funds because you're doing through an amc or a mutual fund company you know who is actually managing it for you the risk actually becomes you know it's much more manageable mm. and the returns you know if you actually invest in the equity funds you could generate returns in you know upwards of 10% 10 to 15% you mm. know on a long term basis so that is one option which i have been actually by proposing and in fact made it made a dedicated video on investing in mutual funds as well and that is something i think we all could consider yeah yeah, yeah. and of course the other option always which is available back home you know is uh, even if you're not uh, you know uh, willing to invest in the formal sector in the mutual funds or other institutions uh, one option which i have been uh, proposing also is you know the lending business which we have back home mm-hmm. although i know there are lots of people who says you no know, it's a bad for the economy and it's a very high interest and all that but given the banking penetration or the financial inclusion Uh, level in our economy or in our area uh, that becomes a necessary because most of the people can't access the formal banking system yeah. and that becomes a sort of a necessary evil kind of thing you still have to have it mm-hmm. so at least you know you can have that kind of business where you can lend people at maybe slightly reasonable rates and also develop that kind of model which we just discussed yeah. whereby you know at least you can get some good returns and actually of course the risk is high but if you uh, manage it well then that's something which i think few people or actually lots of people also doing at least you can do that uh, you know in the short to medium term yeah and and also in 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 the terms of uh, our hometown context everybody knows everyone right so it's much easier to right. operate much as easier. well yes yeah, yes yeah. and uh, yeah and stock market is something that uh, our community really didn't uh, don't uh, get into mm-hmm. much Although yes. even I or some other people who are working in the corporate sector might be, but uh, not a right. lot of us know a lot about. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for but strangely, vi- yeah, the, go yeah, ahead. But strangely, yeah. there are lots of interest. Actually, I was mm. quite surprised when I uploaded a few videos. You know, there are lots of mm. requests to do actually a video on stock market investing. Few people even have come up and said, "No, why don't you do a small course? You know, and do a mm. course on you know stock market investing and all that." I've been thinking about it, but you know, I have to it's, somehow manage uh, time for that. It's but too complicated, think, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's complicated. Yeah, definitely. But at least there are lots of interest. Apparently, I was quite surprised at yeah. the you know level of interest which was there. Yeah. yeah. And for those of you watching uh, or uh, listening to the podcast, uh, um, uh, Francis has his own YouTube channel where he talks about a lot of the finances uh, advice uh, advisory uh, in our own language. So please feel free to check uh, his channel. Uh, I'll put them on the description. So yeah, and uh, you know, uh, Francis, uh, quite uh, you know. Uh, funny but uh, right. i was told by one of my business mentor a uh, few years back okay. that you know if you don't know how to manage your time you will not be right. uh, you will never know how to manage your finances do you agree right, to that right. 
Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, because lots of uh, you know this uh, finances or lots of other you know uh, related career related as well as business or mm. professional related uh, stuffs. Uh, you know what is really required to be successful. I mean, in my opinion, is that kind of discipline, right? Yeah. On the way you manage either the money or your time. So, if you are good in, and you know, some, there's a saying that you know, you don't make uh, you know yourself. You actually develop habits, and you know, your habits make you whoever you are, sort of. Yeah. So it's about developing the right habits, and you know, if you have that discipline. You know, it's about it applies for you know in terms of time management. It times it reflects in you know in your personal finance management and even in your personal life and you know various other professional life as well. So I think it's absolutely right. You know that that discipline. If you have know how to manage your time, definitely you'll be good in you know managing your money and I think various other things because you would have developed that discipline. Yeah, yeah. So talking about time, uh, back home in our hometown. Do you think the abundance of time in the hands of the youth is one of the biggest issue? Actually, I was, uh, you know, been I keep watching YouTube videos and keep reading, you know, books of lots of other successful, you know, businessmen mm -hmm. or entrepreneurs or personalities. Uh, one thing which, uh, you know, if uh, if you observe, uh, and this also I've started experiencing even personally as well is, you know, as you grow up and as you become successful and as you, you know, progress. Uh, the most uh, biggest constraint or the most asset which you realize you have is your time hmm. because time becomes so precious because at that stage you know you want to do so many things hmm. but you have that limited time and you know lots of uh, people start focusing on how you manage your time which is why if you look at lots of the you know businessmen or the successful businessmen because that's when they hire people to do the work you know which doesn't really matter Yeah. For example, you have a, a secretary for you because to schedule the meetings and other thing because you don't want to waste your time on doing those uh, you know uh, works which can be done by somebody else and maybe yeah. even done better by somebody else. <laughs> Similarly, even in the company, there could be various other functions where you know you now don't have the time to actually do it yourself. So you delegate and you hire people so that you know even you as a entrepreneur or as a business can focus on the things that matter because at the end of the day because the time becomes actually very very important. That's why I keep saying, you know, to get uh, one hour dinner with Barrel Warren Buffett, you know, he actually auctions, you know, that time to pick his brain and to spend that time. So yeah. at that level, as you grow up and as people grow up, I think that value of time goes up because you value your time much more, mm -hmm. right? So even on my personal level, I'm doing trying to do YouTube as well, you know, starting a family and various things. I just realized, you know, even my company. I just realized, you know, what there's so many things I want to do, but then you have the limited time. So yeah. then it starts becomes a trade-off of you know what's important, what's not important. So even at my you know at the very basic level, at even at my level, if I can f have start having that kind of feeling, I assume you know how much more you would be with you know those big businessmen and you know other yeah. successful people. So I think that val time value goes up you know as you progress. Mm -hmm. So and as you rightly said, you know when we have to. Try and progress towards you know that kind of situation where you can start valuing your time, mm -hmm. right? And back home, as you rightly said, you know we have uh, uh, tend to have lots of time because we are not engaging ourselves enough into various productive or various things which we he should help us progress even personally as well as even mm -hmm. in our career. So and once you don't engage in those, what you do is you end up with lots of free time, right? Yeah. And lots of time, and you don't value your time, and you actually we all keep wasting our time. And you know, and that happens. And the other thing is, you know, they say an empty brain is the devil's workshop. Mm -hmm. So when you have lots of time, then you start engaging in various, you know, other things as well. I actually watch an interesting YouTube video in which he they actually break up our entire life right mm -hmm. into so many minutes or so many seconds. And he said, okay, you maybe you spend every day seven hours into sleep, right? Then they deduct that. And then you know you have to have dinner, right? So okay, dinner, lunch. Mm -hmm. Then they took out. Okay, we have to take a shower. Then they keep deducting. Yeah. And then at the end of it, you know, it boils down to maybe you just have ten, twelve years actually to make yourself who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the limited time you have. That was in fact actually a very good relevation, even relevation. You know, uh, even for me, mm -hmm. when you think of your life, okay, I have a sixty, seventy years. But when you actually break it down into where the number of hours you actually have. To uh, you know, to put into the effort of trying to become or achieving your goals or you know becoming who you are, actually the time is actually quite limited, and you know the idea there is then you know 
it's quite critical how you use those time you know to make sure that you achieve your goal you know your your yeah. dreams so yeah. i think that is that realization you know i think is because i think we are not pursuing uh, our goals or not realizing that enough and you know most of the time we end up you know wasting that precious time because we don't realize the value yet which yeah. uh, unfortunately is like so much the case as you rightly mentioned back home yeah and also since we're living in a very close knit uh, community back home right and uh, right. we are so much into you know community uh, <laughs> for example there is a ypa or you know uh, uh, cooking p or however we want it or and then, then on top of that there is a church set up right uh, where we yeah, have our yeah, own yeah. thing and uh, mm. so if you want to really really be uh, uh, successful in what you do or where you are studying or you know uh, pursue your goal you'll have to right. stand out you'll have to because yeah, yeah. you'll have to make your own time and right. uh, but the thing is in our community when somebody is trying to do that when tri- somebody is trying right. to achieve that he becomes the odd one out right <laughs> absolutely yeah so yeah. what what do you have to say about that <laughs> in fact actually this question uh, has come you know in various discussions in different forms mm. uh, of course what the other form which it uh, the first form in which it came was you know when you manage your personal finances you know at the same time you need to help you know the church or the various organizations or the various people who need your help at this stage but you at the same time have to manage your personal finances mm-hmm. so how do you balance the two so that was one form in which it came and in the last video about entrepreneurship it was about your social obligations versus your business right yeah, how do you yeah. balance the two and i think this also is similar to the second one whereby mm-hmm. it's about your personal career growth and development versus you know giving it to the society and in all these questions uh, you know i have shared uh, my perspective or my take on this which was uh, as you rightly said you need to stand out you know because if you go with the flow then you know most of the times you get carried away and you know you never able to achieve whatever you set out to achieve and uh, what i and i told you have to stand out and you have to do this and in the meantime you'll also get you know that bad name or whatever uh, you know the description that you just made the tag. you'll get that tag <laughs> yeah. yeah you'll get that tag but i think the way to look at it is uh, it's not uh, it's uh, like i said it's all about you have to play the long term game right yeah. Yeah. so what i always said even in personal finance was okay i my i have to get myself independent or i have to get my business going to be in a stage where i can help others in a bigger way right mm-hmm. so most of the time what happens is you know we just started up i see lots of you know cousins and friends you know who just got a job and you know got a salary but then lots of all these pressure starts coming you know back home everybody is started demanding and you know they keep because we are a society you know kind of holozy we call it yeah. so they started giving and then they run all their personal finances into a havoc right mm-hmm. so what i've been saying is let's all try and stand you know on ourselves independently because if mm-hmm. i can become personally financially independent or i can get my business to a stage where i can help others in a much bigger way because right now if you are trying to help others and trying to help yourself neither are you satisfied or neither are you able to make a big impact and neither are you able to set yourself up because you're killing both or you're not helping both either right so but if we actually take the time right to struggle a bit but reach to a stage where you are able to help others in a bigger way then at that time you know i talked about creating the assets first mm. and then you know from that assets whatever income comes if you help others because your income is not impacted or your asset is not impacted because yeah. the asset is giving the income and you using that mm. so if you reach to that stage then you know you are helping others in a bigger way and they'll also be much more happier and you also not impact even on a personal finance uh, uh, you know level as well similarly if you take the time out to build your career Mm. and once you are somebody in that same church or the same society you can actually do you know much bigger favor for the society and contribute in a much bigger way yeah. or if you are setting up your business okay in the meantime you might have to make some sacrifices but once your business is established you are helping lots of other people by creating you know generating jobs or even doing charity or various other you have the potential to do all that and in fact i gave about what bill gates is doing what warren buffett is doing they are giving you know 90% 95% of their wealth to charity so they could do that because they also got a bad name you know when they are running their mm-hmm. business in fact bill gates you know the big uh, corporate is he got lots of big name and lots of videos you know in the internet but later on once he got there he is able to help others in a much bigger way so i think we need to balance the two and if you are really made for it i think we should be willing to make those sacrifices initially and hopefully as 
things times goes probably even our perception also might change in terms of you know how we look at this overall uh, contribution in the sense you know it's like uh, Without helping, we need to. They always say, you know, help yourself first, and then help others. Exactly. Or you know, change will start from within. So, mm -hmm. I think that perspective, even as a personal uh, at the personal level, I think we should be clarity or should there should be clarity on how we want to manage that, mm -hmm. and even from the overall overall society level as well. I think there should be you know a more generous, I would say, or a more you know a softer way of looking at you know people who want to actually take that part. I think we should be more kinder to them i think is what my appeal would be yeah and and by doing that they will be able to make a bigger impact for us right bigger impact. Yeah. Yes, yes so yeah it's a it's a long-term plan and uh, how do yes, you manage yes. your time uh, personally how can you give me an idea of what's a, a, a day in a francis how keep life would be so uh, i think i'll have to break it up before you know <laughs> before uh, before zane or after zane so you know, after we had the baby, of course, the whole yeah. timing changed. Yeah. But uh, before that, uh, in fact, I used to spend uh, most of my time used to actually go in terms of traveling because as we have investments in different cities. So actually, I, out of five days a week, I mm -hmm. sometimes travel five days or four days at least a week used to be my travel uh, uh, plans earlier just before COVID and of course, uh, before the baby mm -hmm. but after covid as you know it's all about you know zoom calls so almost the whole day goes in zoom calls mm -hmm. but in between all the time i try and spend time with my you know daughter so that's who and daughter and wife so that's most sweet. of the time goes spending time with them and of course in between family calls but one uh, other time which i always mm -hmm. make sure i uh, you know dedicate my time is even when i travel or even when even before or even now I always uh, dedicate time to actually help myself grow personally, right? Even mm -hmm. professionally as well as even personally. So I do read lots of books or I am a YouTube addict. So I keep watching lots of you know YouTube videos on various topics. So uh, I go crazy on one topic, pick up one topic. And then, you know, like there was a joke uh, when this COVID pandemic started. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, I have finished YouTube, right? So <laughs> I have completed YouTube, all the videos in YouTube. So to that extent, like once I pick a topic, I'll go crazy on, you know, all those uh, relevant topic talks. So, so I keep I make that as a habit. So even when I'm you know rocking my baby to sleep, I'll have an earpiece and a video <laughs> on the other side. So I try and manage those times. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, even when I travel, I you know even on the flight. So every week, uh, you know when I travel because I use the flight and you know the airport time to read books. So in a week or two, I try and complete you know one book. So because mm -hmm. that's uh, something which I always try to develop and improve myself. So. That's so even one of the videos I've actually I'll said, you know, in the five buckets, one of the buckets should be towards uh, self-development because mm. I think investing in yourself because mm. that's very, very important, particularly uh, at the 20 to 30s or at the younger age, mm. because you can invest in, you know, real estate, you can invest in mutual funds, but the most mm. important investment is actually investing in yourselves because yeah. that's the biggest asset we all have, right? So yeah, exactly. I think that should be the key focus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's wonderful and uh, you know multi-level marketing I know you <laughs> you have a sweet spot for that right. <laughs> uh, right. I don't know why you yeah. why our, you and I we know and uh, right. many I mean educated people uh, who are outside of uh, our community also knows very well and then uh, right. and a lot of the people inside our community who are back at home also knows this marketing multi-level marketing doesn't work very well but right. I don't know why. Why do you think is the one thing that keeps on pulling it back to us, for, for us? I mean, it. Why do no. they? Uh, why do people still keep on going right. back after having seen a lot of bad example? Yes, You're absolutely right. Even I was, to be honest with you, equally surprised. You know, because uh, we saw this about fifteen, twenty years back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At that time, we thought you know there was no internet, there was not much awareness. Mm. So probably you know people could have come and, you know, lured us to various, you know, lucrative schemes. But, you know, at this age of, you know, information, internet, you know, where everything is available. And fortunately, even from our societies, there are lots of people in different fields, right, yeah, whom yeah. we can consult and whom we can ask. I was uh, completely taken aback when I realized the level of penetration, uh, you know, these schemes have recently had. So when, uh, you know, every day I used to, uh, something around March, April, May, I think, 
you know, I used to get almost four or five calls a day, messages asking for, you know, about various schemes. Uh, I initially thought maybe one or two people are involved in this, but later on I realized that it has gone to such a scale, mm. right? So that's when actually I decided to do that video sometime, I think in May, uh, you know, to actually spread, you know, if it helps somebody take an informed decision. So one of the reasons actually when I started that video, to be honest with you, I'll just be a little candid about this. Uh, some people actually, I was putting out that videos and in fact, there are lots of people who were quite supportive and saying, you know, even I've been trying to explain this, but you know, people don't understand. So it's good that you put out this video and all that. And some of the friend, close friends and other people were telling me that, you know, believe me, it's not that people don't know. Actually, they know it and they are doing it knowingly. Okay. okay. And I, at my level, I said, you know, in our society, you know, close knitted society, you know, how, why would, you know, somebody knowingly try and do such a thing was my, how I actually yeah. started everything with, but I saw how the things uh, pan out over the last few months and all that. I actually realized that actually there's some truth to that in the sense, you know, mm. there are some people who actually knows that, you know, such a scheme is either a Ponzi or a pyramid scheme, but still tries to, you know, promote that in spite of knowing that. So, which was, uh, to be honest, I was quite disappointed. You know, I didn't expect that yeah, at least yeah. back home or in our society. Of course, it's not everybody, but probably there are few. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there were a few WhatsApp chats in which some of the people said, you know, as long as, you know, I know I join early and as long as I get my money back, what's the harm, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that is the kind of mentality back home, then I was, to be honest, quite disappointed and quite surprised at the same time, uh, which I still hope is a very absolute, absolute minority. Mm -hmm. So... So when I started the video also, I knew that, you know, there were lots of people who are doing, you know, following the schemes and even my own uh, cousins, relatives. I know lots of people are involved. And the idea there was not to badmouth anybody or any mm -hmm. scheme because I said, you know, there are lots of these schemes and let people take an informed decision. Yeah. So the idea of the video was to spread the awareness or make it educative so that at least people can, you know, take an informed decision of the scheme and understand them and make their decisions accordingly. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's their money, it's their decision. You and I or nobody has a right on that, you know, right to invest. So mm -hmm. the idea was only to make it an educative and awareness uh, video uh, because that's why specifically there are some people who said, you know, you should have actually taken this, the name of the schemes and analyzed it and all that. I said, that's not the intent here, right? So, yeah. so I intentionally, you know, didn't mention any scheme and all that. Still, of course, there were lots of people who were a little upset with me and, you know, sent me different kinds, all kinds of messages and all that. But I also told them, see, at the end of the day, fine. It's okay. You can make your money that way, provided you're okay. Mm -hmm. But it should not be on the basis of selling some wrong information, right? Yeah. Let the people whom uh, you are coming, who's coming below you or investing, you know, uh, in your line, as long as they know what they are getting into and the risk they are getting into, it's completely fine, mm -hmm. right? It's an investment provided there should be no mis-selling though. You know, mm -hmm. they should not be under the impression that this is something, you know, solid, foolproof investment and that there's no chance of losing money. If, that is, if they are sold on that basis, that's not right, right? Yeah, you yeah. should tell them the true picture. You sell the full picture, say this is the risk. Okay, it's a scheme. You need to get lots of people below you to make your money. And if somebody, if that's not done, then you have the risk of losing all your money. If besides uh, knowing all that, they still invest, I'm actually completely fine. But there should not be, you know, mis-selling or misrepresentation. That's my only concern. And as long as, and the idea of the video is to actually help people understand what those schemes are and then mm. take their decisions accordingly. So that's how I actually told them. In fact, I offered, they asked me lots of questions. I said, I'm actually raising all these questions so that you can raise these questions to, you know, those schemers or you know, <laughs> who people who are making those investments. You should, didn't be questioning me. Yeah. So you should actually raise those questions to them. And I, in fact, offered them, you know, get their balance sheet, get their income statement. We'll analyze it together. Mm. Yeah, in fact, I'm willing to help. But then, of course, they never came back with those documents. But I was... To a certain extent, I was a little disappointed, surprised to that extent. And probably, I don't know, maybe one of the two reasons I was debating on myself why, uh, you know, why we could fall prey to that is, one, uh, because there are lots of people who actually came to me and said, you know, can we invest? And there were lots of discussions. Mm. And after the discussion, they said, oh, okay, then, you know, they went away thinking, okay, probably this is not the right thing to invest. But then a few days after, you know, on the WhatsApp or other status, you see, you know, promoting those very same scheme. <laughs> so I think either they're very good in convincing them or maybe I was very bad in convincing them. I don't know. But, you know, that also did happen. So one probably is because these schemers are smart, right? Mm. One thing we have to be fair to them is 
they have the guts and they are always smart. You know, I always mention about the Harshad Mehta scam mm. and the various other scams because they are the guys who are the intelligent guys because uh, they're smart guys. Only those smart guys can actually come up with those innovative schemes. In fact, the schemes which came this time are quite an innovation from what we had about 15, 20 years back, which yeah. is why we all get full again. So to a certain extent, I think lots of 80 to maybe 70, 80 percent, we got fooled by their smartness and the way they actually innovated. I think that's one big reason for you know us falling prey again. Mm -hmm. Because if it was the same like last time, probably we'd like, okay, this is the same thing. But this time they were quite innovative. So which is why I think most of us also got fooled or you know uh, didn't consider it the same as the earlier schemes. Second also is, you know, there's uh, what happens in all these schemes is they'll make one or two people, you know, an example, a success story, mm -hmm. right? So remember at that time, you know, somebody will get a new alto car. Yeah, then, yeah. you know, then after that, everybody is sleepless. So now I have to get my alto car. And a so foreign similarly, trip, right? they, <laughs> Yeah, foreign trip, of course. Yeah. So what happens is they'll make one or two people a success story. They'll so, you know, even this time, there's so lots of money, you know, they're getting. Then... The natural human tendency is the fear of losing out, right? Mm. So if somebody is getting that much, why should, you know, I shouldn't be losing out on this opportunity. So they capitalize very well on that. And that's the hook. So I think that's where we also uh, get, you know, sucked in. And the third, of course, it's uh, probably is human nature. But, you know, it's always, uh, we always try to find the easy way out. Yeah. Or, you know, a little bit of uh, greed, I would also, maybe it's a like, little stronger word, a little bit of greed or, you know, making easy money rather than, you know, making uh, the working hard. If I can just make some money by some quick uh, investment scheme, then it's always a very lucrative option. So once, you know, you see that kind of return doubling your money in 200 days. If, you know, if without, without the knowledge of what the background is, anybody can be attracted, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think that also is uh, one of the other reasons. And... Uh, as we just discussed, one of the main reasons, uh, as we also discussed, is a uh, little bit of mis-selling, I would say, in that sense. And, you know, people are not presented the true picture. And these are presented as if it's a sure shot guaranteed kind of return, mm. which they are not. So when people, you know, in the, in the unlike uh, a similar background or you no know, proper education background, back home, as you know, most of the people, you know, don't have the time or the knowledge to analyze in detail. So we go by, you know, uh, that uh, kanthology or the face value, right? So yeah, if somebody yeah. comes, uh, we do that. And of course, the last, some of what a few people told me is, I know it's not true and I know it's not a proper investment scheme. I still invested because one of my friend or cousin has been hounding me and asked yeah. because of him, I just wanted to put some money. So even that also happens, right? I was about to say that because, you know, <laughs> right. uh, I was about to say that because, uh, you know, right. you, you fool your family first, your relative first. Before you right, go outside yeah. of that, right? You go outside. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, 10 people fooling each uh, uh, their family, each their family right. becomes 20 people, right? So, right. right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Actually, what really pained me was thought was even at this age, you know, I've been there actually discussing also in various other forums is if you can let that kind of scheme, you know, penetrate, uh, you know, our society. I told him it's actually our collective failure, you know, yeah. let's not. And I told people who have actually lost the money who call me, as I said, OK, you can also blame, uh, you know, people who are mis-selling. But at the end of the day, the solution doesn't lie in, you know, blaming others. Mm -hmm. The solution lies in blaming ourselves. Right. Yeah, yeah. Everybody has to take the time to analyze an investment scheme. Right. We put out some videos as well, you know, where people are putting up news articles. There are lots of discussions going around. When we make an investment, we have to, at the end of the day, nobody came and forced you to put the money or put a gun in your head and say, you have yeah. to invest, right? We just took the decision to invest. So a solution lies in us as ever realizing ourselves that, you know, once we make an investment or anything, in any investment or any decision that we take, we should, you know, do the research and take an informed decision. Once all of us do that, the solution lies there. And which is also uh, the background behind, you know, the videos and the various things we are putting out is uh, let's have uh, that, you know, finance knowledge and that uh, background and that education or awareness so that at least any scheme which comes. Because I keep saying because uh, this is not going to be the end, right? Yeah. It's going to yeah. come back again in some back, different yeah. form and some innovative scheme. But if we have developed that knowledge, whatever form it might come, we'll be able to all analyze and say, no, this is not worth investing. But if we don't do that and we just focus on the scheme then you know we'll miss it again next time you know other scheme comes and we'll all fall prey again which is why that awareness has to be there and at this age let's counsel others let's ask others you know uh, people whom we know in different fields you know mm -hmm. whether we can invest so when for me actually i i 
happened to you know pursue my career in finance so even on a personal level i thought the society as well i thought morally responsible that at least i should highlight otherwise if something like that goes you know for a much longer and a much yeah. bigger way then i would have personally blamed myself as well or felt guilty to a certain extent which is why because of that social obligation also i had to do that's what i told few people who were really upset with me as well okay we'll track back a little bit uh, from uh, i mean we been uh, talking about it but we'll track back a little bit and sure. uh, I'll ask you how are you as a kid are you the uh, front seater guy or the back seater guy <laughs> <laughs> okay i actually had uh, a different fa- a little bit of different phases in my high school uh-huh. so i as you know i studied in uh, semi high school uh, tubong mm. so uh, starting when I, i was in the nursery and i think up to class 1 or 2 mm-hmm. uh, of course uh, i was a front seater and i think even uh, education wise i used to actually perform well but i have uh, had a phase between i think class 2 to class 5 wherein i sort of you know had my own diversion or became a sort of a naughty kid you know where yeah. I actually completely had a complete slide mm. because we had uh, lots of uh, friends at that time you know mm. we got engaged in various other things you know and completely had a slide whereby you know in I think class 3 or class 4 I just got promoted right so <laughs> from there to got promoted and I remember I think in class 5 or somewhere where I actually got a zero in maths so <laughs> and you know as a kid you got into fights and various things so I actually had that phase you know as a kid then uh, I I think it was in class 6 most of my friends who were there with me in class 3 class 4 5 either all you know left the school or some of them fail and I was kind of left alone you know I mm. think when I was in class 6 so that's when a slight change happened uh, you know uh, for for me wherein I think in one of the I think second uh, first quarterly or I think half yearly exam I actually passed uh, in all subjects except maths so then I actually took a tuition and then suddenly i think it was in the second quarterly or third quarterly exam i actually got a rank and i think it was second rank or something uh from then on actually things completely changed because suddenly you know as a kid mm-hmm. earlier you know you get all the scolding and all the beating from the parents and from everybody suddenly you know you got a rank and you're like the good guy right so even yeah. the parents started appreciating treating you differently and everybody started expecting something else from you then that led to a complete change whereby you know i started actually focusing on studies and all that and then i think from class 6 i became you know the first uh, rank holder i got the proficiency certificate and actually things actually went up uh, completely different from you know that mm-hmm. class 6 class 7 then of course after that i think it was a completely different image of me which uh, i think i carried through my uh, college and you know even my studies and i think a certain level of uh, i was the eldest uh, son in the family of course i had an elder sister so that level of trust from my parents even in terms of for various things actually i follow their words and all that but they were kind enough and they were actually trusting enough at least in terms of my career so they always gave me the option or whatever i decided you know they were quite supportive although they always wanted something else Yeah. So, for example, after my ten, my dad wanted me to, as I mentioned in one of the interviews, become a doctor. I said no, I'll become an engineer. So he didn't uh, push me too hard. He said, okay, fine, if that's what you wanted. Then after my engineering, he wanted me to go for UPSC. I said no, I'm going for the corporate sector. And a couple of times, I had to change my job. Like when uh, I joined NTPC, and my dad was happy because now I can finally, you know, take care of my siblings and all that. And I said, "No, I'm leaving for NBA." <laughs> so then uh, he was a little disappointed, but he said, "I told him, don't worry, I'll take my education loan and go." Then he actually allowed me. Mm. Then I went to SEBI. Then they were quite happy because it's a semi-government job, stable and all that. Mm. Then I said I'm leaving again. Then so lots of surprises for them, but they have been quite uh, supportive. So I think I bring it up as a family. The one good part is uh, I Saint Mary's was a good school for me. I would say in terms of the upbringing, mm. because I uh, from the class six seven as I said, since I uh, was the rank holder and all that, so I got lots of uh, opportunities in terms of 
uh, you know, if there was a science seminar or, you know, science exhibition, so, or, you know, whether it's Champur, Infal, then, you know, even, the, even in our catechism, we have the state level competitions mm-hmm. and all that. So I got lots of good exposure in terms of, you know, the, my upbringing at seminaries. So which really helped me later on, with, you know, as you also realize, mm-hmm. later on, as you progress in your career, okay, technical knowledge is one thing, but, you know, your communication, your leadership skill and your, you know, those uh, soft skills become quite important. Yeah. And yeah. I think that St. Mary did provide me a good uh, bringing there in terms of, you know, the soft skills as well. And even the school in terms of organizing, you know, various events and other things. I think I had a very good upbringing in uh, that sense. And of course, in the family, being the eldest, you know, the kind of responsibility, uh, you know, back home for mm-hmm, us, mm-hmm. new pies, like you have that completely different kind of upbringing where you're supposed yeah. to be, you know, the responsible one. So exactly. I think that also kind of, I think, helped my upbringing. And of course, after you're into 11, 12, then of course, you know what you want. And I think for me, probably one of the life, uh, I would say life changing even or something which really helped me was uh, sometimes they say, you know, failure is the key to success uh, or, you know, for your future. Uh, what happened was uh, in my St. Mary's uh, before me, there were two, three batches in which, you know, the topper used to be, you know, a rank holder in the state level, at least in the top 20 or the top 25. So in our badge, uh, since uh, I was the topper in the school, everybody just expected me to <laughs> have a, you know, get a rank in the board exam. And even I also probably thought maybe, okay, I will get a rank. But when the results came, you know, I couldn't get a rank. Mm. Uh, that was uh, actually the biggest uh, disappointment for me at that time. I, in fact, you know, lost even interest to pursue higher studies, you know, go further and all that. So I had that kind of disappointment at that level. But later on, when I look back, that has been, you know, a biggest uh, stepping stone or lesson for me. Because if I look back, had I got a rank at that time, maybe I would have got completion or, you know, that mm. would have completely changed my attitude or my perspective. But that humbling experience actually, you know, really taught me that, you know, it's all about the hard work and the effort you put in. Yeah. And that inspired me, you know, when I, I think I did mention in one of the interviews, when I went to Silong, uh, St. Evans College, I said, you know, I have to do something. So that led to two years of real hard work, you know, and which, of course, enabled me, enabled me to re- get a rank in my 12 in the in Magalia board. And of course, that hard work also really helped because along that time is when you actually, I was preparing for uh, my IIT entrance exam as well. So mm-hmm. that kind of, you know, helped me also eventually get into IIT, of course, in my second attempt. But, you know, that uh, humility or that, uh, you know, embarrassment, I would say, or that lesson which I learned, I think early on, I think that really helped. So even today, you know, going forward, you always have to realize uh, that, you know, whatever you achieve, it's nothing is guaranteed forever, right? So it's all about the hard work and the effort you have yeah. to continuously put in. You know, you can't be complacent. And that teaches you the humility. And I think I learned that early on, and mm-hmm. which I would say has been my biggest uh, strength to achieve the small successes which I have achieved when I, you know, go back and analyze. Uh, so I think I've been grateful for that, uh, you know, upbringing and, you know, that kind of lessons early on has, I think, been very helpful for me in terms of my overall, you know, progress in trying to achieve my goals and whatever I, you know, dream of. Yeah, yeah. that's a very interesting uh, childhood and background you have and quite a yeah. journey. Thanks. From, <laughs> yeah, from IIT to IIM and, you know, from uh, Sebi to here, so quite interesting because some people uh, might just settle with the Sebi or NTBC right. and then you know try to move on from that. But how do you right. uh, cope up with the? How do we climb up the corporate ladder? Like for example, there are a lot of politics involved and favoritism right, right. and then you know sort of this uh, I- in the corporate world that's a norm. Right, right. So how do you yeah. deal with that on a day to day basis or you know? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, Richard. Actually, you know, earlier uh, when we have this career talk or discussions, you know, we just tell people, you know, try for IT, just get into IT, just get into the corporate sector. But later on, you also do realize, uh, from my own experience, as well as seeing a few of your friends and the cousins, you know, the corporate life also is not that easy, as you really mentioned. It's a mm-hmm. struggle. And you really have to have that appetite, you know, to uh, actually before you get in otherwise you know you can lots of people get disappointed as well in mm-hmm. their career and all that you know after getting into the corporate sector as well mm-hmm. so as i mentioned i think for my own uh, personal humble story uh, i actually shared in one of the videos as well interviews 
the key which I so or how I actually grew up or how I actually progressed in my uh, company was uh, the key secret I actually said you know one of the secret if you say what is the one secret to success or at least if you ask me what is the one secret to the small successes which you have achieved I always said it's the mastery right mm-hmm. whatever feel you are you master that and then you know that's the key to success because i actually uh, my i can also share again one of my personal story uh when i joined ntpc because uh, 11 of us i think we were recruited from the iits to be you know future managers in most all the departments in ntpc mm-hmm. and we were given a separate you know training and then at the end of it we were given uh, this lucrative or the most uh, sought after corporate posting in delhi Mm-hmm. So at the time, you know, most of the people, the normal recruits are sent to the plants and lots of people lobby, you know, the ministry and everywhere to actually get a corporate posting. Mm-hmm. So we were given a corporate posting, which we were quite happy at that time and quite proud, in fact, that, OK, you are getting posted in the corporate sector. But uh, when I was about to leave NTPC and I was giving my interviews for these IMs and all that, uh, what I realized was that would have been one of the biggest handicap for me. Because since I didn't go to the plan and didn't have that hands-on experience, I didn't have that technical knowledge or mastery of, you know, how the power sector works, how the plan operates mm-hmm. and, you know, how that business actually the ground is run at the ground level. Mm-hmm. So when I was asked about the power sector or, you know, technical details, I couldn't proudly say that I am from the power sector and I know the sector, right, mm-hmm. for my two years experience. So I saw that as a handicap and I said, maybe even I stayed on in NTPC and even I was supposed to grow up at a certain stage that would have become a handicap because at that stage I wouldn't want to go back now to the plan and learn those, right? So it will be a little like inconvenient at that level. Yeah. So that would have been a lifetime handicap for me. So when I joined my current company, initially, actually, I was recruited on the business development side, Mm -hmm. uh, which would involve getting new deals, lots of travel and all that. But after I joined, I actually told my then CEO and then the promoters, I said, I actually wanted to start off as a financial analyst because uh, my interest in finance and I want to actually get that technical knowledge of how to analyze deals, do complicated spread sales, you know, mm-hmm. it's which is a desk job. Basically, you have to get glued to the laptop, yeah, yeah. do all this spread sale analysis and all that. But I said, I want to start there and spend a few years. So eventually, unfortunately, the guy who was actually the financial leader at that time also wanted to go for an MBA and all that, higher MBA and all that. So he also left so that became convenient and i actually got into that role mm. and i spent the initial three four years uh, literally slogging i actually did lots of uh, modeling read all books attend webinars workshops read all kinds of books in fact i did mention about one book uh, which costed about fifty thousand, which was i think one of the most uh, expensive publications uh, mm-hmm. you know in that field and when i mentioned it to my promoter he said finally he said no no you buy it from the company so he eventually bought that for me as well so mm. that was the level at which I actually went and tried to, you know, grab the whole you know, financial analyst, uh, like I said, the mastery of uh, that art. So what happened after that was uh, earlier when a deal was supposed to be analyzed financially, financially and the models have to be developed. Typically, you know, the financial analyst or somebody who is doing that job would take maybe two weeks or three yeah. weeks to actually get all the analysis done and make the presentation and all that. But since after all those in depth, all these things, sometimes I used to be able to do a turnaround of maybe three or four four days, oh, right? Wow. <laughs> then everybody was quite surprised, right? Then I changed all the format, the analysis, made it simple. Mm-hmm. And when those models were also sent to outside associates, everybody said, okay, could see the change. And they say like, oh, suddenly everything has changed, simple and nice. So they started getting appreciation from, you know, even from outside associates mm-hmm. and even from my promoters. Mm-hmm. So that mastery or that level of focus finally got me that visibility. Yeah. So suddenly you become visible in the organization like, okay, yeah, there is Francis and he's good at this. Mm-hmm. So now every time a financial analyst or something related discussion has to be there, whether it's a board meeting or a meeting with somebody outside, mm-hmm. then, you know, okay, Francis has to be there or Francis has to travel, right? So you become visible and you become uh, sort of an asset in that field in yeah. your particular organization. So then since you have mastered it and you're able to handle your work, uh, you know, much more efficiently, you also frees up your bandwidth to get on other you know, responsibilities. Yeah. So I got then start getting exposures to various events on the legal side, on the various thing where I actually handled a case where we even up to, went up to the Supreme Court and all that. And fortunately, you know, that also got, uh, you know, resolved in our favor with big companies, you know, big names in the country. So all those kind of, you know, get me first, I think that mastery get help me get the recognition or the visibility 
then that gives you more opportunities then of course it doesn't end there you have to learn those skills again and you know deliver on those as well so once you started continuously delivering then a few years uh, back we had started having lots of issues where you know some uh, somebody some else was in the organization was handling those issues mm -hmm. and it was getting lots of them were getting stuck so given by that trend you know i was also asked to chip in and luckily when i chip in you know things i took a good turn you know and things actually started falling in place so when things started falling you know that from that stepping stone when things further and you know that uh, results uh, kind of you know with god's help we kept coming so when uh, there was supposed to be a change in ceo and somebody else was to be put in that position you know i became the preferred choice even other you know many people who were actually much more senior to me even within the organization mm -hmm. so i think the key is you know getting that mastery and be very good in you know whatever field you choose and that will definitely give you visibility okay it's much more difficult in bigger organization but in smaller organizations that's quite easy but even in bigger organization if you do that you'll still get recognized it might take some life a longer slightly longer term but eventually you'll get visible or recognized and once you do that as we uh, discussed earlier don't get uh, be humble we don't get complacent yeah. right still work hard keep delivering on you know the new assignments and eventually i think that's what will finally get you to you know a uh, much better role or a much bigger role eventually i think that is my personal history as well and i think probably i have a sense it will work for lots of people okay maybe if you apply because i think that is typically what would work in all organizations of course there are few things like which uh, like i said it's not that you know i went and did something completely different the other guys were also doing the same thing but things fall in place so uh, i kept mentioning something you know when we had uh, some my charm back home mm. uh, sometime you also need of course uh, some sort of a uh, you know they say poop a party and they say you yeah, know yeah. if you don't obey your grandparents you know if you and if you plug a leaf it breaks kind of thing right mm -hmm. so even that uh, blessings from parents so help i guess because you might be doing the same thing but unfortunately you know when you do it things falls into place so that also kind of helps you know the blessings from the family and the other thing of course all those are also important you okay, know be you might still do uh, have the mastery you might still do but things might not fall in place but yeah. you know but at least you need to have that uh, basic mastery and you know be able to get the visibility and the hard work then you know all those other things happens then you know that's when you actually get that full visibility and the real progress or achieve the goals uh, which you really you know envision for yourself yeah yeah that's rightly said and also you've mentioned that you know uh, getting into the corporate sector is not uh, it's challenging and uh, right. and since we both are in the corporate sector we both know how challenging it is and right, especially right, right. for you it's uh, your uh, role and responsibility are much more higher than us so and uh, you know what would be the biggest misconception that uh, you know a lot of us uh, mm -hmm. have regarding the corporate sector because we as a community hasn't explored too much on the private sector uh, right, yet right. Uh, we i mean we are there but uh, Well, right. we are not there yet uh, not too much so yeah yeah i think one of the uh, probably the biggest uh, misconception about uh, the private sector is uh, we all paint the private sector with the same brush mm. <clears throat> so, sorry i think i didn't mention in one of our uh, earlier former discussions i actually even wrote in a blog mm -hmm. you know when you go back home if people ask you boy pinana to home you know what work are you doing so it's little difficult but you spend you know 5 10 yeah. minutes trying to explain you know what you're doing and this is what i'm doing so finally the conclusion is oh boy company ana na to home right so <laughs> we all still have you know that same uh, we still paint the same brush uh, the entire sector yeah but what has happened you know since economic liberalization in 1990s uh, the private sector has come a long way mm -hmm. and you know there are lots of very lucrative opportunities sectors and fields which are i would say uh, equally as good as you know most of the uh, public or the government sector or maybe even better so there are different fields in which you can progress build a good career and you know be much more successful and maybe even do better than you know in most of the other public or government sector mm -hmm. so i think that is something which we have to be aware at least back home i think most of us in the cities and other places are quite are already aware mm -hmm. but at least at our parents level i think that lack of awareness is still lacking which is why you know if uh, some of the children wants to pursue you know a private sector or corporate sector usually that uh, discouragement is still there 
and yeah. they have to fight that you know little battle to overcome uh, you know the parents objections yeah. or you know lack of support and that uh, in that direction so i think that we need to spread that awareness that you know there are lots of lucrative opportunities where you can actually you know pursue a very successful career so i think that is the first uh, important probably uh, thing in terms of the opportunities and even going by this trend you know there'll be much more opportunities even going forward in the private yeah. sector and things are going to change and the second of course is we can't all go for the public sector jobs because yeah. competition is high and there's limited jobs there as well right as the numbers increase all of us can't get there let's even look at upsc or even the exams they are getting more competitive even you know day by day you might have the reservations but even within that it's becoming more and more competitive so mm-hmm. you know you have and one of the things i wish i kept saying focus for the parents and you know the elderly we have to spread that awareness but even the younger generation or the you know the younger uh people who are actually in the school and colleges we need to really evaluate our options and one thing which i always mention in the career uh, counseling or the discussions is we need to try and identify which career suits you best because uh there can't be a one size fit for all like you no know, government sector is for everyone right yeah. or corporate sector is for everyone it all depends on I actually used to mention this uh, slide where i have three points which is what do you love right and what you're good at and what is the payback or the return which you want and those three has to be you know uh, carefully considered while choosing yeah. the right career for you so even the corporate sector there are lots of good things about the corporate sector and of course it also have its negative the public sector has its own positive or negative yeah. so yeah. the idea is to identify which uh, of course at the broad level which sector is best suited for me right am i yeah. uh, made for the corporate sector can i bear the fight or am i do i need a stable you know corporate sector Yeah. Uh, because in the public sector you know there are lots of positive is you know the stability and all that is there but in the pri- corporate sector if you are a hungry guy you're energetic guy and you want to progress fast then and you're able to perform then you know my one humble example if it was in a bureaucratic setup you know if it was sebi it would have taken me long long years you know before i could rise up to you know the senior management yeah. uh, because it has to go by seniority but yeah. in the corporate sector provided you're hungry and willing to make the sacrifices and make the effort you know i could progress much faster you know even uh, much actually uh, faster than even i had anticipated you know even mm-hmm. i got out of my disc golf so that is the possibility which is there and of course it comes with the various other risks risks as well so we need to identify which is the broad sector in which i want to go. am i for the made for the public sector or am i made up for you know for the cor- corporate sector or do i have what it takes to get into the corporate sector and if you do then in, inside even the corporate sector there are various fields right so which one should i choose so based on your strength your skill set based on your interest and what's the kind of payback or you know what you expect from your career depending on that you know i think we should choose uh, the it very carefully most of us us spend lots of time you know planning a vacation or planning you know various yeah. things but when it comes to career we just go by you know whatever it comes so i the, uh, the my favorite example which i used to give us uh even in class 11 12 whether to take science art or commerce it's never based on you know i want to pursue science so i need to get a good mark so that i can get science in a particular college uh the usually is okay somebody comes in first division then okay he should take science second division may be actually art then third division then maybe commerce we don't realize commerce actually is a very good course right so yeah. somebody who is interested in business you know commerce should be the first priority right yeah, so yeah. we always tend to go by that uh, way of career planning which is why of course you can also become successful by just following the default and still succeed mm-hmm. but if you actually plan and think through that probability of success i think definitely goes up and the probability of being you have being you have you being happy in your career i think that absolutely goes up so i think that's very very critical because as you rightly mentioned even i we all didn't have any career planning we all just went by default and took one step at a time which is why my journey to ntp is semi and realize no i actually corporate so you know that's mm. how you know my our journey went so but uh, they can take the benefit from our experience and people who have actually gone you know earlier so even now we have lots of people in various fields so the younger generation have the option to think through cancel you know the senior people who have in various fields and actually make a much more conscious or informed you know career planning or career decision yeah and also the corporate sector is quite specialized in that uh, in that sense it's right, not it's right. not a very generalist uh, job uh, so it's true, uh, true. yeah so for example i'm a designer so i 
falls into the design yeah. category so you're in the finance business so similarly right. every corporate sector is morely i know there are there will be few options like a you know a desk job kind of a thing but uh, yeah. mostly yeah. it's a specialized sector uh, or everything are specialized so right. uh, unlike the public sector it's much more easier for you to uh, showcase your potential that's what i feel absolutely 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 yeah and as we discuss if you go into the corporate sector that mastery and you know being mm. uh, an expert in your field and, and being obsessional and being uh, you know uh, trying to make yourself visible not through that mastery that becomes very very critical in the corporate sector because in the public sector you might be very good but still mm. you still have to wait for your age to get the promotion exactly. okay you might get other form of recognition but you still have to wait but in the corporate sector you know that becomes actually quite quite important that specialization that mastery of that uh, niche i think that absolutely you know you have bang on you have to that becomes very 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 critical in the corporate sector yeah yeah and uh, i think uh, uh, we tend to not say it but uh, the financials uh, part is also quite uh, <laughs> quite huge yes <laughs> the j- you yeah. can make uh, your salary or your package your compensation completely depends right. on you how you yes, want to absolutely. grow it so right, right. It, within a two year or three years you could have multiply your salary where you started yes. as well so that's something that yes. uh, we don't really talk about so yes yes actually in one of the career planning webinar i've actually had a slide on this comparison hmm. uh, actually as you absolutely right earlier what used to happen was i think one change which has happened is uh, earlier the corporate sector Mm-hmm. Uh, itself used to get a much higher uh, package to start with yeah. uh, compared to the public sector but now i think the recent change with the different pay commissions because mm-hmm. i observed that with my own colleagues with sebi who stayed on with sebi mm-hmm. what happened is with all these pay commission at the entry level the difference in salary has come down in the mm-hmm. sense the corporate sector used to have a much big uh, hands uh, you know uh, much uh, bigger advantage which has been narrowed down we have a slight disadvantage now in terms of the difference mm-hmm. because the public sector entry level also has gone up but as you rightly said what still remains is how you progress from there Yeah, right yeah. in the public sector you still have to wait for your promotion and the pay scale to go but in the corporate sector where you go from there is entirely up to you right if you exactly. perform and you know deliver multiplying it or growing it is up to the up, entirely up to your hand and that could be you know uh, much much uh, faster or you know could be speeded up depending on your performance yeah and 50% increment is something that you can negotiate <laughs> as well yeah of course if you perform <laughs> yeah. if you become indispensable in the company of exactly. course you can exactly. yeah yeah and 50% percent increment is like uh, quite huge <laughs> right, right yeah. Yeah. yeah so and i think a big part of uh, you know uh, of course it also depends on the company's performance and your performance but yeah, yeah. Uh, in the private sector the big component which uh, also is probably not there in the government sector is the incentives right yeah. or the bonuses which sometimes if the business does well or if you perform well you know that's also is an added bonus because exactly. most of the time with the salary uh, typically what happens of course with proper finance better finance management that can change but typically you upgrade your lifestyle according to your pay increase exactly. so but if you actually get a bonus or something in lump sum that could be used for different kind of investments and various things so that's actually sometimes quite helpful in building you know your assets and your personal finances yeah in fact we we uh, upgrade our lifestyle before we get the money right <laughs> <laughs> most of and of course yeah yeah most of us, right. yeah because yeah, we know yeah. that there is something coming from there so we yeah. already are planning ahead okay i'm going to do yeah, this yeah. i'm going to do that no actually yeah. i'm planning to do probably a video on saying maybe the three four or five biggest financial mistakes you know of my life kind of uh, video yeah. whereby the first thing would be you know as soon as i joined in tpc within two months i went and bought a car right so yeah, yeah. which at that time was not necessary at all so <laughs> we do tend to do lots of those yeah, mistakes you're absolutely right we actually upgrade it much before the pay increment happens yeah yeah so yeah in terms of the compensation yeah it's quite lucrative and uh, uh, you know uh, it's i would suggest uh, our younger generation to join as well and then in, in case if you if anyone who is listening wants to be mentored or have any question you can always reach out to francis or uh, i'll put down his uh, uh, youtube channel you can you know sure, sure, uh, yeah. get in touch with Anytime, him yeah yeah and uh, so one last question would be you know mm. uh, we from the back home from northeast we are quite talented in terms of you know 
uh, we mm. are quite gifted and we right. uh, are very easy, we we easily manage things so we are uh, sen- common sense is much higher than uh, uh, most right. people but uh, yeah. uh, i don't know but uh, we are not able to make it big right so what do you think would be the one reason why we are not able to reach the the stage where we want we are supposed to be as you rightly said i think we definitely have the uh, you know the potential and i think one of the biggest uh, strength which we have mm. typically which i observe and which i uh, or the feedback which i get from lots of people is uh, we are very sincere yeah right wherever we walk uh, you know every organization you know whether people who are working in different organization most of the feedback i get from you know the people who they work with or their bosses is uh, we tend to be very uh, sincere and right and then we are quite honest and simple we don't try to game the system or play mm. the politics or you know we don't we don't usually don't tend to do that so i think that is uh, one of our uh, biggest strengths mm. and the second uh, uh, the strength which we also have is uh, we tend to be comparatively right and good at you know the communication skills and the sports yeah. skills because we all come from the convent school and you know and the bringing up front the bringing in uh, back home typically i think we have that leverage right yeah. so we do have a few strengths in terms of you know or some advantages in terms of you know climbing up the corporate hierarchy or actually rising up in our career i think uh, as you rightly said most of us i think don't uh, rise up to you know to top levels or top levels or you know very senior levels yeah. in the hierarchy or in the various corporate uh, structure i think probably one of the key uh, reasons could be uh like we said earlier one is of course there are things about the politics and various i think that also is there just mm-hmm. to be honest right yeah, we have yeah. to f- fight much more harder for ours because we have that disadvantage we have to be much more better and much more <laughs> fight much more harder but one of the key reasons i would also say is uh, uh that level of uh, mastery or you know technical knowledge which we just discussed earlier mm-hmm. as well Uh, you will find uh, most of uh, even if uh, the mainland india i'll find uh, i don't know what your experience is i do experience uh, some people uh, you know they are very uh, crazy about you know whatever they <laughs> whatever they pursue or whatever they mm-hmm. want okay mm-hmm. it could be just music right it could be just uh, any field but whatever they pursue they'll be crazy right or they'll be a specialist in that yeah uh we tend to be as analysts or analyst, yeah. <laughs> sort of generalists of have good with you know everything mm-hmm. right they'll be master of one thing will be good you know will also uh, you know there was a joke where when i was in not the joke but actually a like comment which uh, my friends used to be when i was in iit they say if you are a nordic guy you know you have to play guitar you have to play football <laughs> you also have to have a girlfriend then you also have to have a leather jacket right <laughs> so we'll try to do lots of things what i think basically that also we could be read as you know even let's say even guitar right yeah most of us will know how to play guitar right you ask any guy back home to come up to the stage and sing he'll sing beautifully play guitar beautifully beautifully but you know nobody will pursue it that to such a great length of becoming a mastery and you know mm-hmm. pursuing like you know some of the panelists you had earlier jimmy and other people there be very few people who will actually you know get that and pursue it as a career and say you know this is my field and i need to master and, and you know uh, pursue this as a field we always uh, whatever we pursue we tend to you know just uh, generalize and don't think of it as specializing and you know acquiring that skill or being crazy about it you know uh, uh and pursuing it as an absolute career with no other options right burning the boats they call it sometimes mm-hmm. we try to do that do this you know keep all the options open and at the end of it we end up being a journalist and not you know uh, being a specialist in that particular field uh for example you see youtube videos of you know kids uh, parents uh, for example even other countries like if they decide to pursue a particular career you know they don't consider too many other options yeah. right so i think that is one of probably one of our biggest Uh, drawbacks for us we have the talent we have the aptitude the right aptitude the right sincerity you know we can also hard work work hard you know we have all that qualities but probably one reason i from my perspective is probably that is uh, the being specialized being crazy about one thing and being you know focused entirely on that and trying to achieve 
you know, excellence in that field and making a career and being successful in that, probably that is something uh, which uh, is lacking on our side. And whoever are pers- whoever is pursuing that other option will also be, you know, reluctantly against everybody's <laughs> wishes or support. You know, they're trying to do it and then how somehow, you know, manage uh, uh, to, to climb up, you know, that particular field. Whether it's my field or your field, or field because you would have uh, faced lots of resistance and, you know, probably lack of support in that field. But because of your, in spite of all that, you know, you have pursued probably even our musicians or even, even let's say even football, right? Earlier, yeah. you know, of course, now people are saying, okay, that's a career which you can build. So maybe there's more support for that particular career right now. But earlier, you know, you get always get beaten up for going to the field and playing every inning and coming late, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every weekend you'll go for these football tournaments. Yeah. And once you come back, you're you're going to get some good beating because that's <laughs> so. And if you so for somebody wants to even who's really good and wants to pursue that career, that support also would not be there. And they were also never thought about it as you know developing that specialization and developing it as a career. For example, in mainland, other people, let's say somebody, some child has a talent for music from right from his childhood, they'll train them, you know, send them to courses and do that, which we won't do. Even football, you know, various other fields, even the corporate sector, you know, the fields which we choose. I think that is probably one of the reasons why maybe we don't rise up to that level, which slowly is uh, changing. And hopefully as we see more examples and more role models you know, in various fields, I think hopefully things will change, which I keep mentioning about my I am Bangalore interview. You know, even at that time I was told, you know, why you're from Manipur? Why are you not going for UPSC? Why are you? Why do you want to go into the corporate sector, right? Yeah. So even at that time I told, I think I you, you must have seen one of the interviews I said, you know, there are lots of people in every field, even from the Nordies, like you have politicians, you have sports person, you know, bureaucracy. We already have lots of role models, but in the corporate sector, we don't have anybody, you know, exactly. to talk to or to look up. So I told him, like, you know, I want to actually pursue, you know, the corporate sector as my career and hopefully set an example in my own small, humble ways. So, in fact, actually... Uh, that was an honest question. I think probably the panelists also could see that. So after that, they asked me to sing a song and then they actually asked me to leave the interview. So I thought <laughs> this is either very good or very bad. Very bad so, yeah. but fortunately, you know, they selected me. So I think probably it was good because it was a very, very short interview. So, yeah. And the, uh, as a people management, uh, do you think uh, we uh, people from the Nordic tend to be a little bit soft? I actually so one thing which I observed Mm. Uh, even uh, okay, as a Nordist community in general, as well as even within our mm. community, mm. I think I think I see some few nuances in terms of people management, mm. because as you grow up, believe me, you know it's all about personal management that yeah, yeah. you are dealing with, you know, most of the time. Especially you know where I am right now, it's all about you know managing people, their expectations, and keeping yeah. them you know engaged and enthusiastic and passionate and all that. So. One thing which I observe, as you rightly mentioned, is uh, one thing which I am also learning, to be honest, is sometimes uh, what happens is we tend to be sort of maybe over overly humble or yeah, we tend yeah. to try and, you know, uh, to be a little soft. But sometimes what happens is uh, being that is treated sometimes or misconcept or misrepresented uh, uh, or misperceived as a weakness yeah, yeah. sometimes. This is my own uh, learning. So being soft and being nice, you know, sometimes, although it's good, uh, as per even the management concern, various things, you know, it's good, but sometimes that is easily perceived as a weakness by some people. Mm-hmm. So, which is why I think we have to be slightly, which is also my l- lots of learning along the way. Uh, you know, when I started off, because I also, you know, got into the CEO position at a very young age, and, you know, so it's a hard learning that way. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are lots of people who are, so, like I said, much senior to me in the organization. And, you know, that's most of the time get misperceived. So I'm also learning and readjusting, right? So that, you know, that is not... Cons- you have to be... In, I'm not saying you should be arrogant or you should you know, be harsh and all that. But you should ensure that, you know, that should not be misconceived as a weakness. That, in yeah. fact, that should be seen as a strength. So you should know when to act up. So I try to, you know, do things, set examples in some way that, okay, some things won't be tolerated. So, you know, you have to find Mm. your own ways of demonstrating that, you know, that's actually not a weakness, that's a strength. Because I have seen uh, people who are, you know, it's it's, uh, still humble, still soft, but still very effective. Mm. And I think that's a skill we can learn. And skill, believe me, I'm also still learning. So, 
I think that is something, as you rightly said, we tend to be scissors soft and humble. And we have to make sure that that's not misconceived or misperceived as a weakness. I think that's a very important point. I think you've done so far. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people management is uh, quite tough, to be really yeah, honest. Yeah, that's absolutely. I'm, I'm also absolutely. learning. And it's not. No, it's really because. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I said, you know, machines, I keep saying, you know, if you input something, you know, this is the output you're going to get, right? Mm. But with human beings, you know, the same input, different time, different circumstances, the output always changes. So, yeah. you know, you have to be, you have to be very uh, sort of more diligent and more watchful of what you say, what you do uh, mm. to actually manage uh, effectively, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I think uh, one of the things that I... Uh, I learned during my experience is that I find it easier to work with the main lane people than the, our own. Uh, right, people. right. Okay, okay. Well, that's interesting. That because no, uh, actually, some of yeah. them. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Because they, uh, the main lane, or you know, other uh, bigger, uh, uh, more cultured people, they tend to right. understand things the way we discuss or you know talked about it whereas uh, when we work with people from our own right. community what happened is that uh, you know they take things we take things personally to be really honest that's what i feel okay sure. absolutely. absolutely so absolutely. because uh, yeah for example yeah, i might have a subordinate who is uh, from uh, rajasthan mm. let's say for example right and then we have a differences right. in opinion i can shout at him and say that, no this should be done this way th- th- like this mm-hmm. and after that i c- we can both go and have tea and then uh, you know smoke a cigarette or something like that yeah yeah right, right. which i cannot do with my own community <laughs> people i wouldn't be able to do that yeah yeah yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely that's that's, right. that's yeah. there. Yeah. That's what I feel. Yeah, I don't know about your experiences, yeah. but I <laughs> <laughs> felt that. And yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Because I I think uh, to that extent, actually, there's different hierarchy. For example, if you look at the US, it's a pure corporate, right? Pure professional. Yeah, yeah. There won't be any personal thing. If you come down to India, you're right. Uh, they'll be, you know, slightly still more personal than maybe the US or the other, mm. you know, fully corporate countries. Uh, but they're still a little... Uh, but there will still be a bit of uh, you know that personal touch will still be there. Mm-hmm. But if you boil down to you know Nordis or you know our hometown, you know the balance will tilt to the other way around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that I think uh, you know uh, that's why in most of the discussions you know uh, lots of uh, the effort is always even I personally try because. Believe me, some discussions happen, you know, even within the team, there'll be fights, quarrels, you know, there'll be yeah, arguments yeah. and all that. So what I always try to divert or draw the attention is let's not discuss the personnel. Let's dig out what is the issue, right? Which yeah, is, oh, yeah. I think, one of the management concerns say, discuss the issue, not the, you know, the personalized opinions. Or the, what is the issue? Exactly. So that's how I try to deal with that kind of situation because there'll be lots of situations whether even they might argue with you or they'll be arguing among themselves and you have to, you know, bring the, uh, stop that and, you know, divert that by saying, okay, what is the real issue? Let's discuss the issue and not your personal beliefs or opinions or concepts, uh, you know, conception. So I think that's uh, one way of professionally dealing with it, which uh, I think we have to develop <laughs> further, uh, and which I think goes as you get more into the corporate culture. I think exactly, yeah. exactly. but that is still I think quite an important yeah. aspect of you know that personal management. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, it's been quite a conversation, and uh, thank yeah. you so much for sharing your uh, insights on how you deal yeah. with the corporate culture and then your thought process on you know. A uh, few of yeah, the things yeah. that uh, uh, the topics that we discuss. I look forward to no, speaking to you again sometime. Yeah, <laughs> but really appreciate yeah. Richard. Actually, before uh, you know, with sign off, I actually wanted to comment. Uh, actually, uh, give a shout out to you and you know, uh, appreciate you. Give you kudos for doing such a commendable job because I think this is what we require. You know, whatever little knowledge or experience we have, you know, we share it. Uh, yeah, just yeah. to share a small personal experience, uh, even I take lots of effort, you know, you did mention some people to reach out to me if required. Mm-hmm. If it's about career or professional or, you know, various other issues, I always also try and personally make the time because yeah. my uh, one incident, I think, which I mentioned in one of my uh, discussions as well is when I actually went to Silong, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and this is the reason for me writing the blog, the YouTube, and you know, we used to have lots of career counseling seminars. You know, I try attend and do whatever I could in my own small possible ways. 
uh, the reason or that inspiration came from uh, actually from an incident sometime back when I was in Silong. Uh, when I actually went to Silong, I actually I knew I wanted to pursue engineering. But, you know, at that time, we didn't know about IITs, we didn't know how to prepare, mm-hmm. we didn't let alone, you know, what co- corresponding course to join, what to study. So, there's a cousin, uh, uh, one of my cousins back home, actually, Mang Tang, who actually is now working in the AZ colony in Infal. Mm-hmm. And actually, later on, turned out to be my wife's uh, poo, no? like <laughs> mom's brother. Uh, yeah. but so, what happened was we went actually to Silong together. And once we reached uh, Silong, I told him I want to prepare for engineering. Then he actually guided me saying, you know, then you have to try for IITs. This is the how you should prepare and this is the coaching institute you should join. So even before I entered the hostel or joined the college, we applied for the corresponding course. I got the sample, you know, mm-hmm. documents, uh, text. And then I started my preparation right away. And, you know, the most important was I was able to save lots of time to start preparing while I was doing my 11, 12. And even with that, I could get IIT in my second attempt. So when I look back at my life, you know, after I joined IIT and all, I actually looked back. And, you know, there was a recording I saw in one of the movies that was the end scene. It says, you know, life is made up, you know, there are lots of hours and moments in life, but it's actually made up of few critical moments, you know, Mm -hmm. which decide or which completely change the path which you take. So when I look back, I think that incident was actually that life changing moment for me, because had that not happened, you know, I wouldn't have not got into IT and, you know, my life would have gone, could have taken a completely different turn. Exactly. So since then, you know, I said whatever small or humble our experience might be, a small guidance or a small experience sharing could actually create a critical life moment for somebody else. So I have been encouraging others and, you know, trying to do it myself. When I was in Delhi Engineering, we formed this Tech Chapas and, you know, conducted career counselings in Delhi, mm-hmm. back home and other places. And whenever I go home, I also actually go to the schools, you know, interact with students, mm-hmm. even in the villages, the churches. So I you know that I think is quite critical and this also is a good platform you know to do that kind of encouragements yeah. Yeah. Uh, because a simple experience sharing from somebody you know could for could be a life-changing real really a life-changing moment for somebody else so that has been my you know that's why I always try and make the effort I actually started a blog you know because people used to keep asking me about MBA and management mm-hmm. so it's difficult to keep you know, explaining to everybody. So I wrote a blog and said, please read that and that, you know, come for any specific questions thereafter. So yeah. I kept writing a blog. And then later on, you know, with YouTube, everybody, now you don't have the patience to read through, you know, full <laughs> page and all that. Yeah. And you'd rather listen. So that's when I also shifted to YouTube, when my wife also wanted to, you know, she's so passionate about cooking mm-hmm. and all that. So I said, you start the video, you know, you start a channel. Then she said, no, we have to do it together. So that's when we started about a few months back. We uploaded a video on the CISO channel before. Then, you know, we just did it as a passion, but everybody actually appreciated it. And, yeah. you know, thousand subscribers within a week. Then we said, okay, let's try and actually do this regularly. So that also is part of the effort. And, you know, small efforts, but probably hopefully for one or person, you know, it might be a good, uh, you know, import or a good uh, awareness or a good, could create a simple, you know, life changing event for somebody. So yeah. I really appreciate your effort because the work you have done, the lineup which you have, I think will can have a real impact because uh, the kind of, you know, the panelists and the kind of discussion which has happened could actually really have lots of people actually back home. And even, you know, us who are here, I'm also, you know, watching them and, you know, enjoying the episodes. So you, really so appreciate the hard work. Please do keep it up. And actually, I uh, feel really honored and privileged to be one of the lineup because the other lineups are so great. I was little, you know, a little scared to be on the show, but <laughs> I think it's really good to, an honor. And thank you so much for having me. No problem at all. Thank you so much.